What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? Of course, you know it's your boy Beehive Radio Shout in. Stepping in the building, I got an A Town legend off in this thing. A man that's put it down for the town. Brandon the Jacket Edge. What's good with it, hey, boss? What's up, Beehive? Man, feeling good, feeling great. First off, I got to say, appreciate you stopping through this thing, Thank boss. Thank you for having me, bro. Like I told you, I be watching you all the time. My so God. I'm glad it's my turn to sit in this seat. <laughs> Raise hell in this thing. B, take me to day one, man. What was mm-hmm. it that got you? attracted to R&B and when was it that you realized that you had the gift? Mm. Wow, I think even before I was attracted to R&B, mm. I was attracted to singing. Yeah. Um, and I can remember, man, if, if I really, really go back, I can remember riding in my mother's car one day. I couldn't be no more than seven, eight years old. Yeah. And I'm singing a song from, from uh the movie Annie. I don't mm-hmm. remember which one of them. I just remember I was singing one of them songs. My mother stopped the car. I was like, "Boy, you got a nice voice." Yeah. And from that time, like for ever, ever since she told me that, I'm like, "Damn, I got a nice voice." You know, what I'm saying? <laughs> because my mother, um, I mean, she probably made her name in jazz, but she's you know, in terms of Atlanta, been a gospel singer around the, around the city for a yeah. long time. So you know, to have her give me that compliment, it, it meant something. Exactly, you know it meant something. Yeah. I mean, but you had a whole twin in the car with you too. He wasn't saying he it, wasn't was it? At you? this point in time. Like, okay. I remember this story. This was my story. You know what I'm saying? Because we got a lot of stories we <laughs> share. You know what I'm saying? But this was my story. Like, I remember her saying that to me. Yeah. And I don't remember her. I don't, I don't even think he was singing that. <laughs> yeah. She ain't say nothing to him that day. Yeah. So, But I mean, that's where it started for me. Like, just mm-hmm. hearing her give me that compliment. Yeah. And then when I was about, I want to say probably 11 years old, my mother got saved. Yeah. Um, and once she got saved, she flipped the script on us. Like we couldn't even listen to R&B music. Damn. <laughs> so for like three, almost four years, we couldn't like in terms of her being able to hear what was coming out of our room, yeah. we couldn't listen to nothing but gospel. Damn. But when she went home, you know, we listened to N.W. We listened to all <laughs> kinds of shit. <laughs> Real shit. Yeah. So, um, so to me, I think it kind of it kind of transformed from that. You know the stuff that you see in movies and musicals and singing yeah. along with shit I used to see on Grease or yeah. things like that to gospel music, like just like that. Mm-hmm. And some of the gospel music that I got into was just like you know they legendary gospel people, the Winans, yeah. the Mission, uh, Daryl Coley, John P. Key. Mm-hmm. So that kind of like that kind of like gave us the pipes right there. Mm-hmm. The gospel, singing in church, singing hard, yeah. um, singing in your choir week after week, you yeah. know, every Sunday, every Saturday in choir rehearsal. And that kind of gave us the pipes. Mm-hmm. And then me and my brother are originally from Harvard, Connecticut. Okay. So we moved here about 11, 12 years, something like that. Yeah. And what I, what I found here was that the music industry was here. Yeah. Like one day I'm probably, I want to say 16 years old maybe. Mm. I'm standing on the corner down in the AU, went to go see one of my home ones. And I stand on the corner there and, and Chili rides by in like a blue Honda Civic. Mm. Like nothing crazy. You yeah. know what I'm saying? <laughs> and that shit just hit home like, like, damn, that's her. She right there. Yeah. She regular as hell. Yeah. Y'all could do this shit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and that, and honestly, that's kind of when it took form for me. When was it that y'all formed Jagged Edge and that you realized that the group was about to take off? Mm. We formed Jagged Edge, I think me, we was about sophomore going into our junior year in high school. Mm. Um, me and my brother at that time, I think we was about to go from Clarkston High School to Reading High School. Okay. Um, my mother became a member of a church in Atlanta, well, on the east side, Decatur, called New Birth. Is, you know, everybody knew yeah. New Birth now. But at the time, it was just a little small chapel on a yeah. little hill. You know exactly. what I mean? Exactly. And so we became members of that church, and that's when we met Kyle. Mm-hmm. Kyle was actually the youth choir director, like the dude who stands up there with the cranking you know, it up. Yes, yeah. Right? So, um, my mother, my mother actually met Kyle first. She told Kyle she was like, "Look, if you get my sons in this choir, mm-hmm. I'm gonna throw you a pool party." Ooh, we had a pool party, so <laughs> clearly we was in the choir. Exactly. But it was it was different for me because in this choir. Like, you know, it's it's a bunch of real, you know what I mean? Really? Like, you got yeah, wild kind of directing right, the thing. Wild kind of directing. <laughs> so it was different because I felt like when I was going up in when I was going to church in Harvard, Connecticut, I didn't necessarily feel like that was the case. I felt like it was a whole church 
uh, environment. Yeah. You know what I mean? And maybe it was like, holy. people like me wasn't, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's how I felt. You yeah. know what I mean? That's how, but when I got to Atlanta, I felt like the people of the church was the, the same the people community. I am. You know, exactly. the real community, right? So it made it a lot, a lot easier to kind of dive in, you know, mm-hmm. both feet. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So Kyle, um, he introduced us to a, a, a couple people because at first, um, Jagged Edge was his, was a church group, and yeah. we was trying to be another take six, you know, uh, gospel yeah. acapella, but yeah. young. Exactly, and we thought for a quick second that might be dope. But I don't, you know, at, now that I think about it, I'm like, man, that shit would have never worked. <laughs> but at the time, that's what we was thinking about. Yeah. So he introduced us to a couple more guys who um, they fell off real early. wasn't really as dedicated as we was. Yeah. And um, you know, at 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 about eight or nine months into us rehearsing on an everyday basis, mm-hmm. this lady named Mia Red held a uh, a talent search. She had a, a, um, a ca- not a casting agency, but a, I guess it kind of, it worked kind of both ways. Like she would develop talent for the music in- industry as well as um, like sign up younger talent and put them in commercials and yeah, things yeah. like that. So she had a talent agency called Busy Brats Talent Agency. Mm-hmm. She held a, uh, a little audition one day. We came in there and honestly, out of all the people in there, she only took us. Dang. She had a whole office full of people and out of everybody she saw, she only took us, and we weren't even Jagged Edge at the time. We was Twin AK. Uh. <laughs> twin AK. <laughs> so I'll tell you how crazy we was. Yeah. Right? But so so um, after that meeting, she she pulled us in her little office, and she was like, you know, I want to work with y'all. She's like, I see a lot in y'all, and you know, she put us in a um, on a rehearsal hall every day like, mm. over at Grant Park. We yeah. would go there every day after school for like two years. Yeah. And. She met a lady named Deidre Tate who used to work for Michael Bivens. Mm. Um, Michael Bivens had a show in Atlanta. They came here as a part of one of those tours they was on. I think it was them, Keith Sweat, and somebody else. After the tour, he invited us to their hotel. Um, we had like four songs we sang for him. In the middle of us singing our second song, he stopped us. Like, hold up. He left the room and he came back with Ronnie and, and Ricky. Yeah. He was like, I want them to hear this too. Mm-hmm. So we sang the, the last two songs and like almost immediately he offered us a deal. Mm. Sent us a pay, he sent us paperwork maybe three, four months later. Um, but at the time Mike was doing a lot. He had a lot of groups, a lot yeah. of things, he, you know. And he sent, us a, he sent us a letter maybe another three months later saying he had overcommitted himself. Mm. And if we wanted to stay and see how this worked out, we could. Or if we wanted to seek a new record deal, we could. Yeah. Of course we chose to. Seek a new record Exactly <laughs> But you know Even to this day man Like Mike plays He plays He plays such a big part In this Because he gave us That confidence Yeah He was like This nigga just put out ABC Boys Come the on. Men, And he wanted us exactly. You know what I mean So that gave us that You know what I mean We was We was up here after that You yeah. know what I mean So we, we really owe him a lot In terms of just giving us that belief in ourselves, helping us to find that belief in ourselves. Yeah. For sure. Linking up with JD, though, man. How did y'all find that guy? Candy. Uh, Wingo and Candy went to uh, uh, school together yeah. uh, at Tri-Cities. Okay. Um, after Escape first album, Candy was already, like, thinking of how, she, you know, the entrepreneur she is. Mm. She already thinking of how she could branch <laughs> out and, you know, make some more money. Yeah. So Wingo had gave her our demo just trying to play it for her, like, to see what she thought. You know, yeah. get some ears from somebody who in the industry, mm-hmm. see what they think. He played it for her. She loved it to the point she was like, well, I don't, you know, I don't just want to hear it. I want to take it over and see what I can do with it. Yeah. So she took it to Jermaine. Jermaine told her, I remember he told her, he was like, this like, this not out yet. Damn. He was like, "This sound like something that's already out. You sure they ain't they ain't out nowhere?" Come on now, that's the that's a true story. Yeah. So he invited us to his house. Maybe two, three weeks later, we walked in the house and he was in there playing. Uh, I think NBA Live. It was NBA Live. Back. That's how long ago yeah. it was. <laughs> NBA <laughs> he Live. Playing, right, he in there playing <laughs> NBA Live. I remember Kyle picked his remote up, cut his TV out because at first he didn't even want to look up at us. Oh, you know what I'm oh. So Kyle picked up his remote, cut his TV off, and then we just started singing. Yeah. The whole time we singing, like, I'm thinking in my mind, we killing shit. Yeah. But he giving us that, you know, that, that stone <laughs> CEO look. Like, he don't want to show you that you doing some shit, right? Yeah. So we walked out the house thinking we fucked it up. Mm-hmm. Candy got a call maybe 10 minutes later. We was about to go to the mall because she thought we was depressed. 
<laughs> so she get a call like 10 minutes later and it's Jermaine. He like, nah, tell him don't go nowhere. I want him. I want to sign him. And that's that's the Jermaine story. So when y'all linked up with Jermaine and it was time to get busy as writers, mm-hmm. what was that like being able to pin those hits y'all self, man? Man. You know, it was a quick point in time that we almost lost our deal. What? Because, you know, we had Zero going there like, look, tell JD we got to write our own shit. Mm. And JD was like, man, I ain't never had no, he was like, even though I know they got a pin game, I ain't never had no artists come at me like that. Yeah. You know, and we almost lost our deal behind that. <laughs> <laughs> so Zebo, because him, Zebo and JD was so close at this point in time, yeah. Zebo could pull him over to the side and say, hey, you know, they, you know, they beside themselves right now, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so we was able to get it back. So ironically, we ended up writing all that stuff because at first we didn't know. You know, mm. we knew we, that that's what we wanted. Yeah. But, you gotta think, Jermaine did all the songs on Criss Cross album, all the yeah. songs on Escape album, most of the songs on Brat album. Yeah. So we was the first people was, that was really coming in the door like, hey, bro, like, you know, you know, we from the South, we got something to say type of shit. <laughs> <laughs> like we had something to say. Yeah. And so we, we didn't want to be another artist where our story was Jermaine's story. You know what yeah. I mean? We wanted to have our own story and our own music. Exactly. You know I mean? So we fought for that and we, and we got it. And we was able to get it. What was it like for you when you pinned that first hit and that thing charted on you, though, man? man. <laughs> when you realized that you could do this and right. you got the skills. Right. Now, that's a, that's a whole nother animal. That, or I should say creates a whole nother mm. animal. You know what I'm saying? But mm. I think I realized, um, you know, really our first number one record in terms of a song we was a part of, co-writing or writing, was Nice and Slow by Usher. Yeah. So... When that song blew up, I'm thinking to myself, God, like this, that song was huge. Exactly. Huge. So I'm thinking to myself, like, God damn, like our first shot at it, and this what we on? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah, that that'll make you very hopeful for the future, and we was. And I think that when our first song that we wrote for ourselves hit, which was was gotta be. Yeah, gotta be. Man, I don't. It's like sometimes you try to explain that feeling, but you it's hard to put that shit into words. Damn. You know what I mean? It's like a, it's like a. A lifetime of dreaming and working towards some culminating into one moment. You hearing yeah. your song on the radio, exactly. And so it's hard to. It's to me, it's always been hard to put that into words exactly. But yeah. it, it felt incredible. You know what I'm saying? It felt incredible. Working with a young Usher at that time, though, man. What was it like writing for him and getting his stuff together? Mm. It's crazy because Usher's second album. Um, which is the one J- JD is when he first comes in the Usher life. Yeah, because the f- Usher's first album was Puff. Okay, so during Usher's se- recording of Usher's second album, it's the same time that we're recording our first album. Mm. We going everywhere together, shopping together. Yeah, um, and so like getting to know him just a little bit. I wouldn't even say I got to know him fully back then, but yeah. just getting to know him. Just a little bit. I seen that number one, he's a real dude. Yeah. Um, number two. He's as ambitious as anybody I knew at the time. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And 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 I knew that that takes you far. Yeah. Your ambition and your work ethic takes you far. Exactly. So I think to a certain extent, we because he was out before us, we were still like soaking the game up. Whatever yeah. it was he was dropping, we was just, you know, oh, that's how that went, you know. Yeah. And that's kind of what the relationship was at first, yeah. Being an R and B crew and not a quartet, man. I mean, That's what was fact. it that made y'all say that we were gonna be a crew and we ain't gonna be? Y'all had to let folks know that y'all was jagged edge, right? We was different. Um, what made us put that out there is that it's certain parameters to be in a quartet. Mm-hmm. You know, it's almost like certain unspoken, unwritten rules to being in a quartet. And we ain't like none of them. You know, we didn't like that. Oh, because it's a four it's a four man group and everybody can sing that, you know, damn near every song we trying to showcase every voice. Mm-hmm. We didn't like that off the top. Yeah. Because I feel like certain things feel good on certain people. Yeah. And if it sound good on him starting off the first verse, it's gonna sound just as good on the second verse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we ain't gotta try to stick this person in there and that person in to make it happen. Yeah. And uh, that was one of the main things for us. The other thing was that it's like as a quartet, people always expect you to come show up and sing. Mm-hmm. And we we never, like I would see other artists that they never asked that of. You yeah. never asked, 
you know, solo artist to come on there and just, hey, why don't you give me something real quick? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But a four man group, it's like they think you always. Your voice always in tip top shape. <laughs> you go to do morning shows six o'clock in the morning, Damn. asking you to sing. I'm like, bro, this is not yeah. well because we used to party party. Exactly. So six in the morning, our voice sound like shit. <laughs> 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 and we just wanted that that point of realness that our career have to do more specifically with who we are, yeah. not with who the groups was before us. You know exactly. what I mean? Exactly. So that's why we always say we a crew, we not a group. You know what I mean? When Gotta Be took off, man, with that being the first hit to go on ahead and go out of there, what was that experience like for y'all when you realized that, okay, now we are in the game, mm. we got a hit song, and folks is respecting our mind and grind. Right, man. It felt like, um, like I said, it felt like sky is the limit. You mm. know what I mean? It feel like I think so. So many times when you're young and black and you're in the hood, like you, you don't know where it's gonna come from. Yeah. You know what I mean? You yeah. praying your ass off, like, yeah. but you don't really know where that break is gonna come from. So it's like when you get something and it starts to look like it's gonna turn into something. First thing you feel is apprehension. Ooh. Like you know what I mean? Is it real? Yeah. You know what I mean? And how do I approach this to, to to the point that? It don't start running away from me, you know yeah. what I mean. So those is a, it's a lot of thoughts of uh, intrepidation, you know, mm -hmm. the fear of losing it. Exactly, those are real at first. Like like especially as soon as you get to the point where you are seeing some money for the first time. Yeah, that money feel good, <laughs> and you start to think like, damn, what's gonna happen if I can't get to this money? Exactly. So a lot of times <laughs> at first, when you first hit, I think the success and the good memories and good times, it's still kind of played a little bit by yeah. the fear of losing it, you know what I mean? What was it like when you seen that money, man, and how did your <laughs> life change and mind change at that time? Man, you know, I, I think we, see, we was the type of dudes that we try to take the homies every fucking way. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And that shit milk up your money. That's you know right, that's right. But at first it's great because it's like, I don't want to go all these places, experience all these things by myself. Yeah, you know, and not and when you're in a four man group, you're not really by yourself. Yeah, but at the same time, it might not be that homie you grew up with from the time you was eight years old. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So for us, we knew that we wanted to share the experience. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And a lot of that, you know, you know, we took that shit on the chin because. Just like even in Atlanta, we'll show up to, you know, we might be doing a party with AG or something. Mm -hmm. We show up 40 deep. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then, then, so then it becomes a problem getting your own people into your own party. Yeah. So next thing you know, now you beefing with AG. Now oh, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so it was a lot of things we could have done better. A lot of yeah. things we could have done probably more responsibly, but our whole mindset was that let everybody feel this shit. You exactly. know what I mean? My house was an open door for a lot of niggas. You know yep. what I'm saying? Yep. Because of that same mentality. Like, let, like, let everybody come and get a, a feel of this, exactly. a piece of this shit. Yeah. So now, y'all in the game heavy, man. From the outside, those nine months of grinding, trying to figure it out, and all that practicing and stuff, to now you in the game and y'all going hard and going strong. What was the main differences that you saw? Was the game everything that you dreamt it would be, or did it turn out to be a little something more wilder? Both. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> because I would say initially it was wilder. Ooh. Because we came, like, and, I, you know, I think we was real honest um, on our unsung about this. We came in the game and we hanging with legends off the top. And yeah. Jermaine wasn't like, he wasn't the type of dude who signed us and, was, and kept us at arms. You know what I mean? Yeah. He had us with him. Everywhere yeah. he went, we was. You know what I mean? And that was... That fuck your head up because you start realizing, <laughs> you start thinking like that treatment is yours. Yeah, but that's that's his and that's Brax. And that, so then you start when it's time for you to go out on your own, you act in a certain way already. Yeah, and you almost turning people off and rubbing people the wrong way. And we did a lot of that. And you know, through the grace of God, we was able to have the type of records that made people had to say, "Well, let's reconsider how we feel about Jagged Edge." Yeah. You know yeah. So that's the only thing probably saved us, to be honest with you. What was it like hobnobbing with all of them legends and stuff and being in those rooms, man? Man, you got to think. Most of these people you grew up idolizing, you yeah. know what I mean? And it's like all of a sudden they know you by first name. I go. <laughs> Just because you associated with this man right here. Exactly. That's why nobody never hear me say nothing bad about Jermaine Dupree. Jermaine Dupree, one of the greatest men I know. Yeah. And 
with all great men, it's some shortcomings. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And but uh, at the end of the day, Jermaine Dupree, one of the greatest dudes I know. He put me in the place. He put me in the rooms of those people that you're speaking of, and and he gave me the type of nod to where they had to pay attention. Yeah, and that's what it is when you fuck with somebody like Jermaine. Yeah. If he walk you in, they got to pay attention. You know exactly. what I mean? Exactly. That's what he did for us for sure. Being on so so deaf at that time, but that label being off the chain. What was that like? Being a part of a movement that was going crazy. Man, it's it's crazy because I still feel that moment to this day. Exactly. Like anytime I see Candy, Tiny, any of any yeah. of us, I still feel that same energy that we yeah. that we had back then. And you know, I think. Like any sports team, um, you know, to be a part of a team that's winning. Yeah. Of course, there's that that point that part of you that wants to brag and like, hey, this us, and you know what I mean. But what's more importantly is that you created a legacy mm-hmm. that's gonna last beyond you being here. Yeah. And that's probably the, the the biggest best part is that I moved to a whole city that's like half the country away from where I was born. Yeah. And these people embraced me. And loved me, and we was able to do some real special shit that's gonna last here beyond us being here. Thanks. So I just, yeah, that's that's the, the dopest part of it to me. Like I asked Wingo, I gotta ask you the same question. Every man wants to know what is it like to be an R and B superstar <laughs> and go on the road with the women crowing crazy just because you sang it. Man, what you was know. that like for you, B? <laughs> <laughs> man, I, listen, man. It's, it's, I ain't gonna like, talk about me talking about this shit. I got two daughters, like. I, I, <laughs> but I was hell on wheels. Yeah, you know, I was saying like this. Yeah. We all have seen the movies, right? Yeah. We all have heard the stories, and it's a hundred and fifty percent accurate. A hundred and fifty. Like the time a woman, certain women, I should say, hear your voice on record. Your life gonna change in that aspect. Damn. Period. Like it's not like we probably like to think it's we we so special this. <laughs> no. Nah. From the time he heard your voice on record, if it sounded good to him, your whole existence with women will change. Period. That's how it go. What was that like for you then? Because as a man, you go from being a regular Joe Blow in these A Town streets to I mean, they going crazy. So how did that affect you mentally too, man? Right. I mean, I honestly think if it wasn't for the fact that, like, you know, I played sports growing up. Okay. Um, in 10th grade, I was the MVP at Clarkston. Well, hell. So, so, yeah. so um, I think, like, that kind of exposed you to a certain level. You know, girls like yeah. you for this. You know, so mm-hmm. you get to understand, like, you can do certain things that draw certain female attention to yourself. That's right. And how you handle it is really like a, it's really just a, a, a um, Kind of like a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Extension mm-hmm. of who you really are. Mm-hmm. If you go crazy behind it, that's just who you really was. You yeah. was you was girl crazy, you know. Yeah. What I'm saying? yeah. But if you know how to put it all in perspective, know how to move and, and stay on your grind, stay on your hustle, and keep that in perspective, it's mm-hmm. it's a great thing. It's a great thing. Let's get married. When y'all wrote that thing, did you feel like that was gonna be the greatest song of all time? Man, <laughs> some ain't gonna lie. People ask me that too. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I felt like. If I'm be totally honest, bro, when that song came out, as big as it was, it went to number one twice, right? Shit. And so, as big as that song was, I had the belief at that point in time that Columbia Records didn't really, they didn't really hold their black artists with the esteem mm. that they used to. Um, and I ain't gonna say that they used to because at first they didn't have a black music department. But at first, Jermaine was kind of the black music department. Mm-hmm. So anything he gave them, they were shooting that shit through the roof. Yeah. Then they created their own black music department, which yeah. signed Destiny Child, Fuji's, all yeah. kind of stuff. And they kind of looked at. To me, I felt like they was treating, they was disrespecting Jermaine's records. Damn. So I went to Jermaine. I told him that, and I think I was able to make him understand where I was coming from. And shortly after he left, mm-hmm. but I felt like. For Let's Get Married to be such a universal topic, mm-hmm. even though that album sold three million copies, it should have sold seven or eight million My because God. it's such a universal topic. Exactly. Not because Jagged's so great. <laughs> We're talking about something that everybody, everybody damn near on the planet gonna do. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, in my mind, I thought the record should be a little bit bigger. And I yeah. felt like if we was in sync, it would have been. 
Uh, and I felt like if we was back, because you understand that's when we yeah. was kind of more, yeah. you know what I mean? We, we was dealing with the machine of the white boy bands, you know yeah. what I mean? Uh, versus what we do. Yeah. And it was like, you could see them like, they'll, they'll come out with a new record and they're promoting that shit on the Grammys yeah. or American Music Awards. Yeah. We come out with a new record, we on fucking 106 in Park. Yeah. So it's a game that the industry always plays, right? Mm. And it's like, the game is you ain't did enough, right? Yeah. But we not gonna allow you to cover that ground to where you can do enough. Mm. It's, it's, it's like this. It's this game that they play with a lot of black artists. They'll tell you this is not your demographic. We talking about middle mainstream America. This is not your demographic, right? Yeah. But you'll come and promote in sync doing trying to do what we do yeah. or trying to do what New Edition did because yeah. they were more of a you know yeah. so or Sam Smith trying to do what a Brian McKnight does yeah. you'll promote the hell out that shit and when we look in the game different ground you'll tell us we can't because that's not your demographic this is mainstream America this is pop this is but pop is what people say pop is there exactly. is no real form of pop music you know exactly. what I'm saying it's whatever's popular at the time so we would have these issues with our label all the time, like us speaking out about certain things and they not liking it. And, you know, it, it, it just, to me, it kind of put us at a disadvantage in terms of our records being as big as they could have been. And we didn't know we was cutting our legs off like that. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. We thought that we could bring certain things to their attention and yeah, it'd change. be addressed. Exactly. Yeah. It'd, be, it'd be changed. It'd be addressed. What was it like fighting those battles behind the music, though, man? Because, you know, as fans, all we get to hear is the music and see the shows, but mm -hmm. we don't know that you were back there fighting for your right to party the whole damn Thanks. time. It's draining. Yeah. It's draining when... First of all, we know in the music industry how many how many labels lose money every year. You, you lose more money than you make in the music industry. Mm. So when you find something that's actually, you know, created its own little niche, yeah. you respect it. And, 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 and to me, you try to keep that intact. Mm -hmm. And I felt like we were always fighting to be Jagged Edge. Mm -hmm. Like I can remember, this is a true story. Two, two of the execs at Columbia Records told us this story. So, I saw, so I, that's how I knew it was, a, it was a true thing. After, it was either at, after Gotta Be or maybe He Can't Love You. Mm -hmm. Donnie Einer, who was the head of um, Columbia Records at the time. Yeah. And Donnie is a great dude. I don't, this is nothing against Donnie. I think he just didn't get it at the time that he should have. Uh, but I've always, I've always had love for Donnie. But, so Donnie Einer in one of the um, music meetings that they would have at the label every week, I think it was every Wednesday back then, he, 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 he basically kind of stood up in the meeting and said, what we need over here is like a, we need like a boys to men. Yeah. And one of the, one of the reps who was in, who knew was, was in tune was like, you got jagged ass. You talking because at the time we we are what's it? Not exactly. Not, not boys to men. <laughs> Nothing against them. I love them exactly. guys. Exactly. But at this moment in time, we are what's it? Exactly. So he's like, man, you know, I know the grind is a little different. I know that it's a little bit more urban than boys to men. But you got jagged ass. Yeah. And that's what let me know we was never really going to be understood at that record label. So. What is that like knowing that there's a ceiling? It's, and you ain't got no choice but to get busy in those kinds of times, man. That's what you got to do. You got to get busy. But I think it's the type of thing, it'll stifle your growth if you let it. Yeah. If you say to yourself, I can't never get out of this. You know what <laughs> I mean? It, it can st but I, was, I always looked at it like every record, every new record is a chance to get out of it. Yeah. And whether it was true or not, that's how we looked at it. You yeah. Know what I'm yeah. He Can't Love You, when that one went crazy. Just talk to me about coming with that song and then the emotions behind that, that the ladies felt and the men felt at the right. same time. Right. He can't love you like I love you, girl. Stop playing. Shit. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's good. No, I mean, I think it's rare in music you find records like that. Yeah. That you can attach to the male as well as the woman equally. You know exactly. what I mean? Exactly. And I think that... um. It was something about that record sonically. Mm -hmm. um, the chord progression with the beat just going crazy. It was just something new. Yeah. And I think anytime we hear something new, we jump on it. As mm -hmm. you know, our culture, we exactly. hear some new shit, we jump on it. And that's kind of what happened with He Can't Love You. That, that record sold like a half a million singles. So 
You know, and people always talk about the number one records we got. He can't love you in the number two. Mm. <laughs> went to number two and sat, it didn't cross that border, but it went right to number yeah. two and sat there. So, you know, I just think it was a, it was a great record that was that was a record that came along in its right time. You know what I mean? What were the records that you just knew after y'all made that thing? It was about to go the fuck down. Gotta be. Talk to me. Time I heard, gotta be finished, like mixed and everything. I don't know, bro. That shit grabbed me like no record ain't never grabbed me. Mm. And probably even to this day, like no record ain't never grabbed me. Yeah. So I knew. I just knew this is a hit record. Like nobody can't tell me nothing different. <laughs> this is a hit record right here. What about where the party at? You mean to tell me when y'all heard that thing come back on, y'all didn't know that it was going to be? I did. I come did. On. But see, where the party at metamorphed into what, it, what y'all heard. Uh. Where the party at started on, I can't remember the sample with you, but it was one. It was a sample that they loved on the West Coast, mm-hmm. and we got Daz Corrupt, me, and my brother Daz Corrupt. We all went in the studio, and we created the first version of Where the Party At. Damn. Um, fast forward maybe three years later, when we were recording the Jagged Little Thrill album, mm. JD's like, man, after that, um, after that, let's get married remix. Y'all got to come with some fast shit. Like yeah. y'all, y'all tore the club up with that. Yeah. So. He started playing some beats, and once we heard that beat, we already knew this shit right here. You know what I mean? Because it's so different. It's like, whoa. So we already knew that was the beat, and we we knew that we had wrote this song that would go perfect on it. So we took the lyrics, re-sang it on this beat, and that's where the party at. What was it like holding on to that song for three years before dropping that thing? Man, that's a good question, <laughs> I mean, I think like anytime you you sitting on some dope, you 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 eager okay. to put it out. But the game was so different back then. You had to wait. It wasn't no taking things in your own hand. You couldn't. Yeah. You, it just something you couldn't do. Yeah. So you learned to just just live with them feelings and just push them back down a little bit yeah. and, and wait till it was ready. You know what I mean? What are any songs that you knew were hits that flopped? Mm. And you're like, damn, we done put all this shit into this damn song and this song ain't do nothing. Well, I wouldn't say it flopped. Good, Goodbye still was a mildly successful song. Yeah. But coming off of Where the Party, I thought it was going to be the biggest record ever. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Like, Where the Party has sold a million records in like four weeks. I mean, albums. It sold yeah. the Jagged Little Thrill album Platinum in four weeks. <laughs> So I'm thinking the, the, the next thing we do is gonna be it's gonna be even bigger than that. Exactly. But this is what happened with Goodbye, right? Mm-hmm. So Goodbye is a record that was the video was directed by Forrest Whitaker. Yeah. And the video is so dope because it really will bring up that emotion, like watching a movie. Like, so if y'all recall, you know September 11th, 2001, right? Mm-hmm. This happened like a week before we were supposed to shoot our video. No, we were scheduled to be in LA a week before that happened. Yeah. Let me, let me get this right, right? So we was actually supposed to be shooting the day after two, uh, um, after 9-11. Mm-hmm. So when 9-11 hit, you know, we knew the complications in terms of the military and all that shit, yeah. but we didn't look at it like, damn. The country's so fucking sad right now. Yeah. They don't want to be reminded by seeing some imagery that reminds them of what's going on in real life. Exactly. So we took that video to um to TRL. We premiered it on TRL. Mm-hmm. And I promise you, bro, it wasn't a dry eye in that audience. Damn. Like, I, if I recall, even Carson Daly was getting a little, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So... What happened with that record is that it was just the wrong, terrible, wrong timing. Yeah. One of the best videos we ever did. Like I said, Forrest Whitaker directed it. Barry Pepper from the Green Mile, he starred in it. Yeah. And so, like, we totally missed that because of coming with it at the wrong time. You yeah. Know what I, mean? but I thought the record was going to be huge, bro. During y'all career, B, were there any times where you wanted to get off of the roller coaster and say, you know what, this is too much? Or mm-hmm. did you feel like you were built for it and you just enjoyed the ride? Yeah, I was built for it. Um, okay, I probably I probably have come to that point of feeling like I want to get off the ride, but yeah. not because I wasn't built for it. Sometimes it just feel like like we talked about when that ceiling is there uh, and it's being imposed. Ooh. It's not really real. It's not yeah. something that the world has put on you, but the company that you in or the you know producer or the yeah. label owner. Yeah. Um. So I think 
sometimes that, like I said, drains your energy. Yeah. But when you build for it, you just keep coming back trying to figure it out. And that's, you know, Jack, we 10 albums in. Exactly. That's because we keep coming back trying to figure it out. <laughs> Come on. And luckily, um, you know, by the grace of God, we have always had labels willing to fund our experiments. You know exactly. what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So, like I said, when we decided to do these last two projects independent, I felt like it was really for us a money grab. Yeah. Because I feel like you give so much away to the label. You know mm. what I mean? So when you can go and make all that money on your own, even if you're not at the numbers you used to sell, it's, it's the money. Still, the, still, money the money's at the exactly. numbers you used to sell. <laughs> Shit. So, yeah. I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. Talk to me about the independent grind, too, because then also that allows you to see your value and what this music industry really does mm. to a man's bank account at the nice. same time, too, man. Um, the independent grind, again, that's the one you got to be built for. Yeah. Um, you got to take certain, you got to make, you have to make your goals around independent success different. Mm -hmm. Because it's rare that independent artists go platinum. Yeah. Luckily, you can. Um, lightning might strike in a bottle and you might go platinum, but most of the time it don't happen. Mm -hmm. So I looked at it like, if I did all these, you know, all these songs for an umpteen amount of years, mm -hmm. where fifty percent of it is going, probably even a little bit more, yeah. is going to someone else, I owe it to myself to put out some shit where a hundred percent of it go to me and my brother. Facts. So, and that's the whole. Honestly, that's the whole reasoning behind us doing independent records. Yeah. No other reason. Like we had deals on the table. Um, we. I, st I got two deals on the table right now. My God. <laughs> <laughs> so it's never, for us, it was never that. It's just like, you get tired of seeing somebody make the lion's share from your, <laughs> your intellectual work. property. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So that's the whole reason behind Independent. Touring with J.E., man, what was that like being on the road, just doing the shows and singing wow, your songs bro. across the world? Wild, man. Like, Man, you know, you got three names from Decatur, one name from College Park. <laughs> like, we took this show around the world. <laughs> but, I mean, for me, again, like I said, it'd be hard for me to even say certain things because I got two little girls. Yeah. And I don't want them to one day pick this shit up like, <laughs> oh, that, oh, that's what daddy was doing. <laughs> but. I feel you. In the spirit of truth and honesty. Yeah. Man, Jack. We were some wild boys, bro. Yeah. We were some wild boys. Um, I thank God I made it out of that because, you know, you, sometimes you put yourself in situations where you might not make it home. You yeah. know what I'm saying? We was in a few, couple of them, quite a few of them. So. Y'all was having to whoop ass on the road? Man, was we? <laughs> oh, come on. Y'all was to be singing. Why y'all got to whoop some ass? Because I think, I think sometimes people come to you with a certain energy. Uh-huh. And they really just want to see what your energy like. Uh-huh. But our energy be like that, though. So, you know, and if you ain't going to back it down, we ain't either. Exactly. So some shit gonna happen. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, but as well as the fact, I think as young as young dudes, you think you're supposed to handle your business like that. Uh -huh. You don't realize it's more advantageous to have a conversation with that man. You know Thanks. what I mean? You think, like, you know, coming from where you come from, this is how you handle shit. Yeah. You know, I don't, as a matter of fact, I don't know too many times where I've seen shit handled in another way. Mm -hmm. So this is all you know at first. And then you start to see these music execs and music people, like, they damn near, they damn near running the other way when you come in the building. Because they don't want no confrontation with exactly. you. And that's when you start to realize, like, oh, shit. <laughs> like, we really, we kind of fucked ourselves. We NWA you know this thing. <laughs> But, at, you know, I think as men, we stand on our behavior. We stand on who we were back then. We stand on the changes that we've made today. Yeah. But that was us. Absolutely. Why did Matthew knows how to kick y'all off the bus? Because we don't be going for that bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Matthew don't never love to tell the whole story. Matthew okay. was going to put a 16, no, Latoya had, was 17, about to be 18 years old, a, eight, a 17 year old girl off in the middle of Louisiana because. Her mother came and got on the tour bus. Mm. Matthew had an issue with Miss Pam, and Matthew was, he wasn't on the road with us at this point in time, so Miss Pam kind of flew in and rode the bus with us. Yeah. Because she did that, he was going to put that girl and her mama off the bus. 
Me, I know I was up in the front. I think it was me and Kyle. It might have been me and Wing. I don't remember. But we was like, hell no. You ain't finna put her off the bus. In the no. Yeah. So little did we know, <laughs> being the little young troublemakers we are, little did we know, it don't matter because we paying for the bus. The, mm-hmm. the groups are paying for the bus. Mm-hmm. But Matthew Knowles did the contract. Mm-hmm. So his name is on the contract. So all he got to do is call the police and tell him, I want them removed. And they came and removed us. Damn. Four 19-year-old guys and a 17-year-old. No, he's 20 at that point. 20-year-old guys and a 17-year-old girl for nothing. We ain't did nothing to Matthew Knowles. <laughs> Miss Pam ain't do nothing to Matthew Knowles that day. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't even in the city that day. Yeah. So he was like, hell no, nah, you ain't finna. But uh, the police had the last word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now I got to ask another question. Who does J.E. want to see in a versus? Y'all know he did our versus. See, this this is this is the fucked up part about Versus, right? <laughs> so now y'all see Versus as this big platform, yeah. right? People coming up with rhinestone outfits, <laughs> whole stage shows and shit like that. We were one of the first people that people were clamoring for. Yeah. So I think we might have been the third or fourth Versus total. Yeah. And we sitting in a studio room like this. Mm-hmm. 112 in another studio um, you know, via yeah. Skype. Damn. <laughs> you know then so, we're gonna have to reverse. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. We will I love to redo it again. Yeah. But so I just think the platform wasn't hadn't reached its zenith the yeah. way we see it now. Exactly. So we did when a lot of people might not have seen it. But we we was like the fourth, third or fourth people to do one. My God. So I think what it was, was right that? after Teddy Rollins Babyface, I think. What was that like when y'all got in there and did Jaws? Man, I you know. First off, I I called Slim myself. I said, yeah. Slim, do y'all want to just come over to the studio and we all be in one room? Yeah. I think Slim said, nope. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, bro, like it's all love, it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. cause we that's my brother for real. Yeah. Like, the little beats we've had over the years don't outweigh the brotherhood that we that we created with yeah. each other. But Slim, that's my brother. So. I didn't understand why he didn't want to do it, but I know if they had done it, it would have been a whole lot better because our yeah. our verses had all kind of technical issues. Uh, uh, you couldn't hear certain songs, and, you know what I mean? So it would have been better if they had came and did it with us. Now, moving forward, doing y'all thing independently and stuff like that, what has that been like for your creative process, making the music, and do you still have that same hunger that you had 20 years ago? Mm. I think, um, damn, that's a good question, bro. (laughs) Shit. I think I have the hunger to give the core fans what they want. Mm. I don't have the hunger to be out here trying to gain, you know what I mean? I don't don't have the energy or the hunger. If you don't know Jagged Edge Dope by now, then whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I ain't out here trying to pull as many new people as I can in. Yeah. I want to service the ones who've been down with us for 20 some years. Yeah. They deserve that. Um, and the thing about Jay, like Jay, their fans is boisterous. Like yeah. they'll, they'll let you have it. Yeah. So those are the people I want to appreciate going forward. Like mm-hmm. for real, for real. When you think of appreciation, man, what part of your career do you appreciate the most? What was that point where you felt like you was having the time of your damn life? Mm. And if you could live that part twice, you wouldn't mind doing it. Man, that's a good question. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I had to say, after, uh, well, after the success of Let's Get Married, we went on this tour with Mary J. Blige, Mm. um, us, Mary, and Carl Thomas. My God. And I can't remember a night where that motherfucker wasn't lit. <laughs> like, you know how sometimes shit is lit. Yeah. And this path, like, every night was that past that lit. Damn. So for that tour, like, I just, you know, us having number one records to really go out in, in front of a crowd for the first time and flex our own muscle. Yeah. It just felt like we had arrived. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So that period of my life, uh, irreplaceable. You know what I mean? Irreplaceable. Favorite artist to work with? Mm. Wow. Favorite artist to work with? I would have to say, I got a, I got a few. I think um, it's a rapper, and I know a lot of a lot of people in Atlanta don't even know who he is. Mm. But it's a rapper named Cool G Rap. Yeah. You might yeah, know because you into this exactly, shit. Bro, you know yeah. what I'm but a lot of times I brought that name up and some of my niggas didn't even know who it was. Damn. So, niggas. 
Yeah, come on. So you know? like I said, I was born up north. Okay. So, uh, so I have the 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 luxury of being exposed to both cultures. Yeah. The East Coast, the the down south, the, the West Coast, all that shit. Exactly. So when I was growing up, Cool G Rap was that that nigga, like yeah. you know what I'm saying. And in about I think 2001, he reached out to us to to, to do a record. No, I went and did it. You know what yeah. I mean. So even though a lot of people didn't hear it. To this day, that's still just like one of my biggest, best memories. You know what exactly. I mean? To me, Cool G Rap was that nigga. Like, he could rap like some of the people that we hold up as the greats. Cool G right he there with him. He, he right there up. with him. Yeah. What would grown ass Brandon go back and tell young ass Brandon? Relax. Ooh. Relax. You know, a lot of this piece, a lot of piece of the things that went wrong was me. Damn. Because I was the leader. I was in that, you know, I was the one dealing with the labels. And I was the one, the point person out the group. Okay. So a lot of that shit that went wrong was me. I didn't I didn't have the temperament for it back then. Um, I think all my guys probably seen a leader in me. Um, I know the label probably saw that in me. But I didn't really have the temperament. I didn't have the life, the life experience to pull from. Yeah. To say, okay, nah. Yeah, he kind of was disrespectful, but you ain't really got to jump down. His, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you don't know that. Like, you don't really know those those parameters or those safeguards when you're mm -hmm. young. Um, somebody make you mad, you think you're supposed to match that with some, with some madness. You exactly. know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And, and that just create more madness. Exactly. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, Jagged Edge, we got to some shit at Disney World in that. Damn. To the point we owe nigga like millions of dollars behind this shit. And I, and, I, and I had to think about that shit. Like, <laughs> Kevin Wells called me one time, man. Big shout out to Kevin Wells. We had been out, me, Brian, and Kyle. We had, this is before we had even came, but came Jack then. Yeah. I'm take you back how far this shit has been a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we had, we used to go down to Georgia Southern, like, almost like it was like a resort, like yeah. a vacation town. Yeah. So we go out there one weekend, it's homecoming weekend. And Kevin Wells, little sister, was going to school out there. Yeah. So we get into this, I'm talking about like an all-out race war. Like, like frat house white boys on our ass. <laughs> you know <what> I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so we get into like an all, I mean, by the, by the grace of God, nobody died that night. It was yeah. a true like 30, 40 on like seven or eight niggas. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So when we get back to Atlanta on that, Sunday or that Monday morning, Kevin Wells called me, and then, and and just the emotion in his voice, he was like, "Man, he was like, yo, y'all have got to stop fighting." Damn. And when he said it, like it felt like my dad, like it made me emotional too. Yeah. And I was like, but you know, I started trying to explain. He was like, no, that's not it. Yeah. Like the bottom line is, no matter what it is, y'all got to stop fighting. Yeah. So. Fast forward to us being in the industry and having these issues, the one of the first things I I heard in my mind was Kevin Wells' voice, like, y'all have got to, and I think, you know, shortly after we got a hold on this shit. Yeah. yeah. But I just think when you from the hood, you don't know how to handle shit. Niggas say something funny to you, and you with three or four other niggas who you know gonna react with exactly. you, you gonna react. Come you on. Know, period, that's how I go. It ain't no different when you sing, it ain't no different if you a comedian. Yeah. Like, if you a man, yeah. shit gonna happen a certain way. That's, that was our problem. What was it like for y'all growing up in the industry at the same time, though, too? Because like you say, when you get your deal so doggone young and then you get the money coming in behind that and the fame, how did y'all navigate all of that just growing up as men and maturing mm -hmm. through it all? Well, the one thing about Jagged Edge, like, no matter, you know, no matter what we might have However, we might have disappointed somebody or what might have happened in the streets. We four church boys. Yeah. So you can always go back to that. This is my brother. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, 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 you know, and, and underneath it all, I wish the best for everybody who I'm with. So if that means that, you know, we got to learn how to handle certain things and, learn how to react to certain things to make sure we all still here to reap the benefits, and that's what we got to do. And that's exactly. what we did, eventually. Eventually. What is it like for you as a twin having a nigga that look just like you every time you walk <laughs> out the house? damn life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, man, wait a minute. This, this is me, nigga. Now, this is me. You know, how do y'all deal with being twins? 
Man, you know what, man? It's crazy because it's the most special thing in the world. You know? Yeah. It's the best thing in the world at a lot of points in your life. Yeah. And then sometimes it's that thorn in your side. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that ain't me, but, nigga. But you learn, like I yeah. said, you learn to go with the with the you know the totality of of every situation. Yeah. And the totality of being a twin is most of it is pretty special. Yeah. Sure, he get on my nerves at times. Sure, I get on his nerves at times. But that's my dog. Like yeah. I don't even. That's the only bond in my whole life. I've never had to question. Yeah. I never had to wonder why is oh why is he around? Like I <laughs> never had that question. <laughs> But day one, he was just right exactly. there. So. <laughs> and that's my boy. That's exactly. My boy. So now, having a family and moving forward, raising these kids, man, how is Daddy Brandon raising these kids? Man, I ain't going to lie to you, man. I didn't know how to do it at first. I didn't yeah. know. I didn't, especially having girls. Like, my first child was my daughter. Yeah. Um. And I didn't know that that meant you really need another version of yourself. I yeah. didn't realize it. I didn't grow up with sisters. There yeah. wasn't a lot of girls in my life in terms of family. Yeah. Um, it's me, my brother, and my older brother. Yeah. So I didn't know that there was a certain, like, um, just a certain softness you need to deal with your daughter. Yeah. And so in my mind, I thought I was doing an okay job, but <laughs> she's letting me know. <laughs> she has let me know since then that I didn't do so well. And I respect it. Yeah. I respect it because I felt the real pain in her voice. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I, I, it's like sometimes your kids can front you out in a certain way and you, and you, and you can match that anger. Yeah. And then sometimes you see the hurt in their face or hear the hurt in their heart. Yeah. And you don't even want to be angry. You want to understand. Exactly. And that's the situation I had with my first daughter. So, but since then, I've been to, I mean, so my second and third, I'm, I'm, I'm A1 dad. You know what I mean? Like, I'm a real dad. Like, my yeah. son is my first child to live with me. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm every day with it. I love this shit. Like, I wish I had it. You know, to do over again for my first two. Like, exactly. I really do, because they deserve to live with their daddy. You know yeah. what I'm saying? For real. Talk to me about the city of Atlanta, man, and how special it was to you, and then being able to be a part of the rise of the city at the same man. time. What was that like? Man, I that's something I think about often. Mm. That, number one, you know, I'm a Yankee. Yeah. Initially. Now I'm a Georgia boy. You know what I'm saying? I've been here too long to identify with anything else. Facts. But initially, I was a Yankee coming down here. Yeah. And what impressed me the most about the people of Atlanta was that, like, the realest of the real embraced me. They had yeah. no reason to. You know what I mean? I went to Clarkson High School. Yeah. If anybody know straight thug school, you know what I mean? Scott Dead. Like, you yeah. know, so CKT. Right, but but you know, I guess it's how they say real recognize real. Them yeah. niggas embraced me from day one. Yeah. And to the point where I didn't have to feel no type of way about leaving behind what I left behind. Yeah. You know, when you first move for somewhere, the first thing you think of, my friends and Yeah. And of course I had them feelings, but when I met so many good good people down here, <laughs> I'm with you. When I met so many people, so many good people down here, it made me not miss it as much. You know, yeah. I, mean? I didn't, I didn't even travel back to Connecticut until we came back out as Jagged Edge. Damn. Yep. So yeah. So now, lastly, B, what do folks need to be looking out for, man? Are there any new projects on the way or anything yeah. else that we need to be knowing about? Okay. Well, in case you don't know, um, the uh, layover mm -hmm. was an album we put out in 2017, I think. Whenever, whenever our unsung came out, we wrapped it up. Yeah, we tied it in together. Yeah, so we put out that album. That was our first independent album. Mm. Um, streamed a lot, um, sold some units. Um, yeah, and then we put out one last summer called a Jagged Love Story. Mm -hmm. So if you ain't up on those two albums, because those are the only ones we didn't release on a major label, if you're not up on those two, get those. Mm -hmm. um, we got new music coming. Um, we actually, like I said, I, I got a couple deals on the tail. I might take the next album back to a major label. Yeah. Might, but ain't for certain, though. I, I don't know for sure. Yeah, I feel that. For artists that are trying to get into the game, man, mm -hmm. what advice do you got for them on their rise and their grind? Mm. Make the grind primary. The grind got to come first. Yeah. 
Uh, I just tell him my homeboy this shit. <laughs> yeah. Because he's 30 some years old. Uh huh. And he's still going after this rapping shit. And it's not like you can't make it. Yeah. But your grind got to be the only thing you worried about at this point in your life. Exactly. And even if you're younger with some time to spare, if you want to get somewhere, the grind got to be primary. Thanks. The ladies got to come secondary. The, come you know what I mean? So, anytime in this game, the, the first thing you got to realize is that what you want, millions of other people want. Mm -hmm. So if you ain't grinding it out, you're not going to get it. You know Thanks. what I'm saying? So that's the biggest part with the music industry. You got to grind this thing out. I can dig sure. it. And how can they contact you, B? Uh, my Instagram is, um, damn, what is my Instagram? Brandon Casey <laughs> underscore J-E. My Facebook is just Brandon Casey. Um... What else is it? I ain't got no TikTok and none of that stuff. <laughs> I'll leave that for the love of the young ones. <laughs> exactly. I feel that. Well, B, appreciate you coming through this thing, you, bro. For real. I've been watching you for a minute, bro. Man, thank you, you man. Do your thing, man. I try to get busy in this Every thing, time man. You do your thing, and bro. thank you for coming in this Thanks thing. For having me. Be high ready, yo. Shout it. Brandon Jacket Edge, we out of this thing. Holla.